So we are now going to have a nice session on the grandfather, the granddaddy, the godfather of all cocktails, the dry martini. Uh, I think that this is the cocktail of them all. Perhaps not the eldest, but it's the one that, that bartender skills are defined by how well they can make this. Everyone's got their own opinion about it. It's a legendary drink that's featured in films and in literature and is associated with presidents and despots alike. And I'm actually gonna make you three versions of the dry martini, but before we get into the drinks that I'm gonna make, uh, a little bit of background. So loads and loads of stories about this. I'm gonna tell you my favorite one, and let's be honest, it's almost impossible to pin down one of the stories. So I'm gonna give you my absolute favorite story and it's about J.D. Rockefeller. Now apparently J.D. Rockefeller around about 1910 in New York was on his way to doing a bit of business with someone, realized he was early and was passing by his favorite hotel at the time. He told his driver to pull over he stepped out of the car, went through the lobby of the hotel, this is the Knickerbocker Hotel in New York, and made his way to the lobby bar, where he was greeted by the bartender who he knew well. And the bartender said, ah, Mr. Rockefeller, nice to see you. And Rockefeller said to him, good to see you too. I have my usual, please. Now his usual was a drink called a gin and French. And gin and French is 50-50 of gin and dry vermouth on the rocks, stirred, maybe a slice of lemon. Bartender said, actually, Mr. Rockefeller, today I have something slightly different for you. And instead of just mixing his usual gin and French, instead what he did was he took out a mixing glass, a separate mixing glass, not unlike the mixing glass that we're going to use ourselves. He then added the gin and the French with some ice, and then he started to stir the ingredients. And the more he stirred it, the colder it got. And the colder it got, the more slight dilution was added. So the balance between the two changed. He then put that to the side and took out a conical shaped glass, not the rocks whiskey old fashioned style that his gin and French would have gone in. He then strained the drink into that glass. By the way, at the time it was called a cocktail glass not a martini glass as we now know, because the martini was not yet invented at that point, or rather was in the process of being invented. He then poured everything into the glass, at which point J.D. Rockefeller went to lean forward and take the glass. He said, actually, hold on a second, I haven't finished. He moved that out of the way, and he went down beyond the bar and came up with a green olive. He dropped the green olive into the glass and presented it to J.D. Rockefeller. Rockefeller said, oh, like the look of this, took a taste. He said, this is nice. He said, this is very nice. Maybe I'll drink this from now and instead of my gin and French. He said, actually, you know what? We need to give this a new name. I think we should name it after you, he said to the bartender. And the bartender's name was Signor Martini. And so therefore the martini was born. He had another taste. He said, you know what, this is nice. I like this. I like the dryness of the gin in here. He said, why don't we call this a dry martini? And there you have it. That was where the dry martini was invented and born. 1910 New York, Knickerbocker Hotel. True? Maybe. Other stories? Yeah, but I like that one. I like that one. And the interesting thing, by the way, coming out of that story, and it's really important to remember is when we say dry martini, dry refers to the dryness of the gin and not the dryness of the vermouth. In other words, the more dry you have a martini, the higher the proportion of gin, the lower the proportion of vermouth. So back in Rockefeller's day, a dry martini would have been 50% gin, 50% dry vermouth. But these days, we've gone so dry that we have just a splash or a dash of vermouth with almost all gin. Sometimes we don't even put any vermouth in. We actually just go through the whole mixing process and the serving process with no vermouth at all. We call that a naked martini, super dry, super arid dry. Anyway, I'm gonna make three martinis for you. You can see I've got three different glasses here and I've actually got them chilling, which you can also see. So I've got some ice and water just to bring 
the temperature down. In an ideal world, uh, you'd have these in a freezer so they come out nice and frozen, but we're in my bar here, I don't have a freezer to put them in, so I'm just chilling with some ice and water, which of course I discard when we serve up. So I'm gonna do three for you. I'm gonna do a regular martini uh, dry, very dry, with a twist. I'm then gonna do what is extremely popular now, and that is a dirty martini. I'm gonna do a dirty martini with an olive, and then finally, I'm gonna introduce you to my favorite variation of the martini, the Gibson. So let's start with our straightforward dry martini. I'm also gonna do all three of these at different levels of dryness as well. So first things first, I'm gonna take my mixing glass and I'm gonna add the gin. And I wanna make this whole cocktail a 75 ml cocktail, and the vast majority of this is gonna be gin. So I'm gonna put in 50 ml, of our gin first, and then I'm going to add just under the 25, and this is a traditional way of doing it. So I'm gonna show you some different techniques. Uh, then I'm going to add to this tiny little bit of vermouth. In fact, I might even take my bar spoon because I wanna keep this to around five mil. Now, it might not seem much, but these days, five mil is fairly large quantity actually, uh, which seems surprising if you're not used to making or drinking martinis. So I've got five mil in there, and five mil is absolutely enough to give you all the aromatics that come from the dry vermouth. Now I'm gonna put some ice into our glass. There we go, and then we're going to give it a good stir. Now if you've watched any of my other courses, you'll know the key to effective stirring is that it's smooth and fast. Because what I'm trying to do here is obviously blend the ingredients, but I'm also trying to chill it down without over diluting it. I want to really control the amount of water that is released by the ice. And the only way you can do that is by doing it smoothly. And now I can feel with my fingers here that this is indeed getting to the temperature that I want. We want it really cold. There we go. All right, very nice. I'm uh, going to take my first glass. I think I'll start with the smaller one here. We're just empty that, and I will shake out the water. So we've got a nice little chill on that. Take our strainer and strain into our martini glass. And you can see that it becomes quite viscous. And we bring the level up to within about a centimeter of the top of the glass. That is good, I'm just going to empty out the ice because I will be using this again for another drink. So this one I'm going to do a twist of lemon which is really straightforward. Again you will have seen me do this on other training courses for other drinks. And I'm just going to take a large slice of lemon peel, it's the skin really that I want. And the twist is not about what this looks like in the glass, the twist is absolutely about getting the oils from the surface of the skin out and onto the surface of the drink. So I'm just going to squeeze this and if I can get the camera close enough in, you will see that that has sprayed across the surface of the drink. Now, there is nothing wrong at this stage with discarding the peel because you've got the oils, but people like to see the peel in the drink, so I'm just going to drop that in like so and we'll move our first martini, which is a dry martini, very dry martini, over to the side. But with our next one, which is going to be the dirty martini, I'm gonna take it even drier. And it might not seem possible considering how little vermouth I put in the first one, but actually there are all sorts of ways that we can reduce the amount of vermouth that's in there, but still get that wonderful bouquet, the aroma, the herbs, the spices that come through the vermouth. So we're gonna do it like this. This time, I'm gonna take this and put the ice in first. There we go. I'm then gonna take my vermouth, and I'm going to, and I'm gonna do this by hand, I'm not gonna measure it, but I'm just going to trickle a little bit of vermouth over the ice. There we go. So really what I'm hoping to do is get it to cling to the ice a little bit. Now, I'm going to stir this before I even think about adding the gin. So let's stir this around. And 
this is quite good actually. I mean, this is also a good way to chill with your mixing glass, actually. Uh, they do this in Japan quite a lot. They sort of pre-stir their mixing glasses before they actually make the cocktail. Okay, so I have chilled this down. I've got a tiny bit of vermouth in there. I'm actually now, by the way, I've got a sink here just in case you're worrying. I'm just going to strain off the excess. So this excess is a combination of the vermouth that I put in there, plus, of course, any water that came from the movement and dilution of the ice. But what we do have is enough of that vermouth that has still clung to the ice. And I can smell it. It's really coming through. And if you like a super dry martini, then this leaves you with enough of the vermouth to get it about as dry as you can. Now I'm going to add our gin. So again, 75 ml drink. So I'm gonna put 75 ml of our gin in. There we go. There's 50. And there's another 25. Uh, and then we're gonna give this a stir again. So same as before, combining the ingredients, and you might be thinking, well, what are you combining? You're not combining anything, what's the point? Why didn't you just pour it into the glass? But actually the process of stirring does something to it. We already know it adds a small amount of water, so slight dilution. We also know it chills it. And make no mistake, the vermouth that has clung to the ice makes a difference. It will change the gin. Now, this at the moment is a martini, but I want it to be a dirty martini. And I would do this often all together. So I would add this at the same time as the vermouth and the gin. But I want to make a point about this. The thing that is going to turn this into a dirty martini is what I have in here. And what I have in here is some of the brine from a jar of olives. Now how much you put in really is, uh, is down to taste, but most bartenders will put in one spoon of the olive brine. And as you know, the olive brine will be quite salty and it will carry quite a lot of flavor. And in this subtle blend, in this subtle combination, it makes quite a significant impact on the drink. So I'm just stirring that in. Now I am ready to strain. So let me get my strainer on there. I will just empty out my second glass. Let's pop that in there. Give that a shake. And let's strain. So this is our dirty martini. And actually, it's not really dirty to look at. You can barely tell the difference. I think the name probably came, and I'm not sure about this by the way, but I think the name probably came from the early attempts to make dirty martinis probably included a lot more of the olive brine so it looked a lot more cloudy but I think it's the same way with the vermouth has gone it's uh, it's a really small amount there it's all about the subtlety and then this one I'm going to serve with an olive so the original story goes that the first martinis had both they had an olive or a twist uh, these days we tend to choose between one or the other now your olive should be green and should not be stuffed. It should be a green olive, not stuffed. If it's a stuffed olive, then there are other names for the drink. If it's a black olive, there's another name for the drink. So for example, if you use a black olive, we call it a black eye martini. Uh, and if you had, actually, quite nice title for a drink, if you had a black olive in a dirty martini, you would call it a dirty black eye martini. It's kind of cool, really. So there's our second martini. There, so we've got our regular dry martini with a twist. We've got our super dry, dirty martini with an olive. And then the last one that I'm going to make is going to be a Gibson. So let me just rinse my glass again. And this Gibson, I'm gonna show you another way of making it super dry. So, first things first, I'm going to empty this glass. Remember, if I was in an ideal situation, what I'd be doing is I'd be taking this out of the freezer. But I'm not doing that. Second thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to add a little bit of vermouth to the glass. There we go. And I'm going to swirl that around the glass. Now you can do this with a spray. A lot of uh, bartenders put vermouth into small atomizer and just spray. You can make drinks and actually spray over and around the glass later on, but this is one of the techniques that we use. So I'm just swilling this around the glass and really the same sort of theory as stirring the vermouth onto the ice. I just want what eventually is going to be clinging to the glass. So I'm gonna tip that out 
and I'm just going to be left with what has clung to the glass. So let's get that in position over there. Going to get my mixing glass here. And I'm going to add some gin and I'm going to give it a stir. So 75 ml of gin. Now while we're doing this, I just want to tell you where the name Gibson came from. Apparently, in the early part of the 20th century, let's put another 25 in there, the late 19th, early 20th century artist, Charles Dana Gibson, who was famous for creating the Gibson Girl, a portrait of an affluent lady of the time. And he did many, many portraits of this lady. She was a representation of uh, uh, affluence and the ladies of the time, rather than an actual woman, known as the Gibson Girl. He walked into the Players Club in New York, where he saw the bartender there, Charlie Conley. And he said to Charlie Conley, I fancy a different martini. And Charlie thought about it, made him his martini, a bit like I'm doing now, and really was struggling to come up with an idea that would make it different, but actually still a martini. So what he did was he made the drink as I'm doing like this, and just as he was pouring the drink into the martini glass, he had a flash of inspiration. And his flash of inspiration was instead of putting an olive, maybe I can replace the olive with something else. And he went down behind the bar and found a jar of cocktail onions. Took one and popped it in the drink. I'm actually gonna put two in. Gave it to Charles Dana Gibson. He said, love this, love this. Gonna drink my martinis like this forever after. Make sure every time I come into the players club, you serve it to me with a silver skin pickled onion, a cocktail onion. And that's where the drink was born. It was named after Charles Dana Gibson. It became the Gibson. Even today, if you go to work in the Players Club in New York, they will tell you that story on your first day working there. Very proud of that. Got to tell you, there are some other stories that don't involve Charles Dana Gibson, but really it doesn't work for me. This one always works for me. Uh, so how many onions? People fight about this, believe it or not. You know, real purists and bartenders and mixologists, they will say, well, uh, it should only be one onion because you'd have one olive, so just one onion. Uh, or three onions because uh, uneven numbers are lucky, whereas even numbers, so one or three, but never two. But then there is another school of thought that says it should always be two onions because apparently the two onions represent the breasts of the Gibson girl that Charles Dana Gibson always used to draw. So I've gone with two. If I'm honest with you, and I am going to be honest with you, when I make these for myself, I put one or two or three or four on the stick, as many as I can get on there. And on the side, I put a small jar with a load more onions. And I just sit there drinking my Gibson and eating my onions. A fabulous combination. All right. So three martinis, three different ways to make them, three different ways to make them dry. Uh, I could spend another hour or two showing you different techniques for doing it. But essentially, we have the original dry martini with a twist of lemon, a dirty martini with an olive, and a super dry Gibson. Three for you to start working your magic with. Now, last word before we finish our little lecture on the martini, and that is this, is that I would say the more time and effort you put into understanding this drink and making this drink, the better. But the best way to get really good at doing it is that every single time somebody asks you for a martini, make sure you ask questions back. And this is not necessarily aimed at people who are not professional bartenders. This may just be for people who are at home and want to make drinks for themselves, of course. But whoever asks you for a martini, because everyone's got their own idea about how dry, with a twist, with an olive, black olive, onion, whatever, ask the questions. Find out what they want. How dry? What gin? What vermouth? All of these sorts of things. And then you can start to truly craft a martini that will appeal to every person because every person's is going to be slightly different. So there you go. The dry martini.